So I was in the shower, I was cleaning my ass and making all shirts all sparkly, spanking clean. I'm not the funny one, I'm the pretty one. Cock shots. <laughs> <laughs> I just checked myself out. Beatles, music, wine, and then loop up and get on top. The glory hole is like a, a like dick theater. I've imagined your pants. Which means your pants had better come off. Mama needs playtime. I do that. Uh, we're not sluts. We just love love. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Adam. And this is Mrs. Adam. Um, and tonight we're talking about love. Aww. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Unless or you maybe, ask for it. Or maybe, <laughs> please hurt me as long as you know my safety word. Yes. What is love? Baby, please hurt me. But listen for my safety word. It doesn't have the same ring. You know... I'm working on it. It's we're, we'll, <laughs> we, we will workshop this, uh-huh. um, and yeah, that's, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Um, yeah. So um, when when we say the word love, mm-hmm. what do you think of? I think of that warm, fuzzy feeling. Are you being? Are you shitting with me? Or are you actually being real? Because I, I, I can't. I can't fucking tell. Are you like? Are you? Be, don't be cunty. <laughs> no, I. I do think it's that. Um, I would say, for lack of a better way to describe it, an extreme like and comfort. There's safety. I would say in the relationship. Um, I put a lot of trust in those that I love. And it's it's trust that they're not going to hurt me and that on some level they have my interests at heart. Obviously not above their own, but yeah, I would say that it's something like that. And we, it, it then the relationship in my head looks different as well. But as Ooh, far how as... How does that look? It looks... Now I'm all excited. Like, um, like we, we do a lot of things together. We spend time together. We, you know... Are, are always, not always, but often connected. There's, and so it, it is that closeness, I would say. Okay. So, like, for me, when, I, when the word love comes to me, it's um, accepting of all of my stupidity. Oh, yeah. Like, and I do a lot of stupid shit. You know, like, people out there, y'all don't know how much stupid shit I do. I do stupid shit on a hourly basis. Um, and love means that you're like, oh, my God, Bradford's doing something else stupid, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side with him. He's, he, I'm not going to I'm not gonna hurt him. Um, no, but it, it, for me, love is one of those things that... Um, and this, this sounds silly, but I think it's one of those things that, you know, like, no matter what I do that's either foolish or stupid or reckless, you know, you still are on my side. The, my, the people I love yeah. are still supporting me like you know you can say i hate that you did that Mm -hmm. but i support that you did that you know you know it's like i hate that you tried to do that but you know by god i still i'm okay i I support that the fact that you attempted that Mm -hmm. um and for me that's what love is it's that that support no matter what i do that's stupid or 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 if i do you know how i define myself who i am you still love me for for who i for who i am that's what love looks like to me mm-hmm. um but okay <laughs> but tonight <laughs> <laughs> not tonight now tonight we are going to discuss um according to psychologytoday.com there's a great little article um, talking about I, and what what are the, uh, so it's in psychologytoday.com like you said um, it was posted in June of 2016 it's by Neil Burton um, but it, the title is these are the seven types of love so we came across this article um, and when I say we I mean she came across this article and uh, read it and was like oh my god this is interesting we should totally podcast about this uh, and so I knew that there are four the the four Greek words for love. And Mm -hmm. um, so the Greeks, much like the Eskimos, uh, came up with, if you don't know, the Eskimos have like a million words for snowflake uh, or for snow. And the Greeks came up with four words for for love. um, For different types of love. For different types of love, depending on the kind of love you had. Um, And so 
uh, she decided that after reading this article that she would um, show how stupid I am. Um, That's not true. <laughs> Uh, she would read through this article on the podcast, uh-huh. and I would have to discuss my feelings towards each feeling. Well, I think it's first trying to figure out, based on the word, what the that type of love looks like. Like I said, show off how stupid I am. <laughs> and then we can discuss from there. Fair enough. No, because some of these, I don't know that I would get... Exactly. Because sometimes you have an idea as to what it might look like. Yeah, but you're but reading it, so verb- I'm having to do all the work. But verbalizing that can, for me, it's hard because things come up to me like I can picture it in my head, but getting it out of my mouth in words is difficult. And I don't know Greek, so yeah, it's all Greek one. to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so so this is just us reading through an article. Okay. And uh, let's see how we go. All right. Uh, so the first one listed here is Eros. Ooh. Do you know what that is? Well, I do know that Eros was the Greek god of god of love. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the son of Aphrodite, I believe. Um, he married Psyche, I believe, and they had one child who was, I think, Hope. And Hope is who ended up in the box. That Pandora, once she opened the box, when she finally closed it, the last thing in it was hope. There are people out, out, out there in podcast land that are now screaming at me. And if my, he's wrong, just ignore him. You can gladly write in and tell him he's wrong, but it's okay. I'm pretty sure that This is Eros, one of those times we just support him. <laughs> <laughs> because you love me? Uh-huh. <laughs> I am 99% certain that Eris married Psyche. That they, okay. that they fell in love. Um, it was probably, I think it was a big mess of how they fell in love because, <laughs> let's be realistic, it's Greek mythology, um, which is less convoluted, admittedly, than American soap operas, but pretty close. Um, pretty sure that Psyche married Eros. So I think that L- Eros is like love, love. Like when I say like fucking lust, love, like sexual girl <laughs> love. That's what I think Eros is. Okay. How wrong am I? All right. So what this says here, and I'm just going to read it word for yeah, word. Absolutely. Just yeah. read it out. All right. Uh, rather than trying to paraphrase because then I'll I, get it wrong. And I, and I may go, ooh, yeah, or I, I support you where okay. I feel right. necessary. So this says Eros is sexual or passionate love. Oh, it's what I said. And is Sorry. the type most akin to our modern construct of romantic love. Okay, well, let me stop you right there. I know I said I'd let you read this, but right there's the problem. Like, our modern concept, concept of romantic construct. love. Construct. Whatever. Our <laughs> modern co- concept construct. Our modern construct of romantic love is, what did you say, sexual and passionate? Yes. Like, that, but it is when, when, you know, people say that you're going to fall in love or you meet the love of your life. It, it You do picture that, that romantic comedy, like, you know, where those the, you just run into them on the road and there's this instant connection and lust. and. Okay, so two you know? things there. One, I hate the phrase fall in love because you don't fall in love. You <laughs> fall in pits. You fall in holes. You fall in traps. Fair enough. You fall in problematic yes. things. You don't fall into anything positive. Are you saying that love is not problematic? Fair enough. Um, (laughs) Number two, you used another thing that I was going to... Shit. Number two, you said something else that I was going to deconstruct, but I got distracted by the falling in. Okay. Please continue. Uh, So in Greek myth, it is a form of madness brought about by one of Cupid's arrows. Well, that's apropos. The arrow breaches us and we fall in love, as did Paris with Helen, leading to the Trojan War and the downfall of Troy and much of the assembled Greek army. In modern times, Eros has been amalgamated with the broader life force, something akin to Schopenhauer's will, a fundamentally blind process of striving for survival and reproduction. Eros has also been contrasted with Logos, or reason, and Cupid painted as a blindfolded child. I just love that. (laughs) I just love that it's contrasted with reason. (laughs) That right there makes me really, really sad and happy. It makes me sad and happy, or as I like to call it, sappy. Yeah. Um, so that, that is, I guess, the word for the, that All right, so, lusty love. So I'm going to make the assumption that you and I have every style of love on this list. All right. Let's make that assumption. Let's I make haven't that even assumption. read through the list. I but. know. 
I think it'll be great. Okay. It's going to be fine. All right. So we have this love. Um, how, when did you realize that you had this type, type of, like, without reason love, which I love that phrase. Um, um, when d- did, when date you, number one. You did not, you fucking liar. Don't pee when on me I and tell me it's When I told you you were coming inside? Yeah, but, okay. <laughs> yeah. Number one, podcast listeners still haven't heard that story. Okay. Someday we will tell you our origin story, All but right. you still haven't heard that. Um, you did not, because you also on that same night looked at me and went, are you okay to drive home? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure the without reason love meant that I could spend the night. All righty. Um... Then maybe it was when you first stayed the night. So the because first... because most guys I didn't let stay the night. Yeah, but the only reason you let me stay the night was because it was well, practical. Because I was driving to the airport was the next a morning. A little bit of pity, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Wonderbar. bar. Um, oh I, I I don't know. I'm trying to. Because, I mean, we, we've always had a, a very, I would say, sexual and passionate relationship. We have. Always had. That's very true. We've so, always had. So if you're looking at it as, as sexual and passionate, then I would have to say it was from the beginning. Because, I mean, even, you know, it, yeah. Look. If that's what we're looking at is that. I won't lie. I still remember the first second that I entered you <laughs> sexually. Like, I remember that vividly. Mm -hmm. So that's where I feel like I started to build that Eros. I was not accepting of your answer, um, only because... But there was that electric energy, I would say, between us, and there was that that desire. There there was something really magical about the first time we had sex. Um, I won't lie. Like, literally. I still remember the position we were in. I remember where I was on your bed. I I remember all of it. Mm -hmm. Um... So, yeah, that's where, for me, but I, for some reason I can't accept that that's your answer. <laughs> you don't have to accept it. That's fine. I love it. I just have to, I don't have to understand it. I just have to accept it. Uh-huh, but you don't accept it, so. Well, fine. I don't understand it. Okay. I, no, I do. God, ah, fuck. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. All right, number two. Oh, interesting. I don't know that I would have gotten this one. Uh, philia. 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 Uh, well, number one, I like to philia when you're on the bus. <laughs> Sometimes when you're sleeping, I feel you. No? Come I'm okay on. with that. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, I'm not. Philia, philia, philia. So I think of those sexual, like, um, like, um, neck, God, fuck, please forgive me, necrophilia, where... <laughs> That's the only philia I could come up with. People at home are all screaming at me. There's all <laughs> types of... At least I didn't pick Vir- pedophilia. Virarophilia? Fine. Virarophilia, <laughs> which is the being swallowed, right? Uh-huh. Okay. So I'm, I'm sticking with necrophilia because more people know <laughs> necrophilia than virarophilia. Um, so where... We did a whole podcast on philias. <laughs> I did, but we did. What, look, I was part of that. But... I don't remember us talking about philia at all. We didn't talk about the d- meaning of it, now. But I'm going to say that philia means you want to be close to it, that it's important to be, like, close to you. Okay. Do I win? So, uh, admittedly, if you had asked me, I would have said obsession. Oh, that's a good one as well. That's what I... Okay. That's what I would have said. Oh, I like that as well. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but in actuality... <laughs> But in actuality, we're both fucked. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what it says here is the hallmark of philia or friendship is shared goodwill. Aristotle believed that a person can bear goodwill to another for one of three reasons, that he is useful, that he is pleasant, and above all, that he is good. That is, that he is good, that is rational and virtuous. Uh, friendships founded on goodness are associated not only with mutual benefit, but also with companionship, dependability, and trust. For Plato, the best kind of friendship 
is that which lovers have for each other. It is a philia born out of Eros, and that in turn feeds back into Eros to strengthen and develop it, transforming it from a lust for possession into a shared desire for a higher level of understanding of the self, the other, and the world. In short, philia transforms Eros from a lust for possession into an impulse for philosophy. Real friends seek together to live truer, fuller lives by relating to each other authentically and teaching each other about the limitations of their beliefs and the defects in their character, which are a far greater source of error than mere rational confusion. They are, in effect, each other's therapists. And in that much, it helps to find a friend with some degree of openness, uh, articulacy, and insight, both to change and be changed. Okay, so number one, I love this word now. No idea. Um, But that makes so much sense for the word Philadelphia, which if you are from Philadelphia, good on you. But city it, of brotherly it's love. It's the city of brotherly love. And yeah. I love that. That that is that makes so much more sense. And for me, I already know, like without question, mm-hmm. the second that I went from I'm not gonna say I ever changed from Eros, because I still feel like Eros talking about possession and lust and love. I mean yeah. Eros to me feels from the previous definition and from this definition, Eros to me feels like this. It, it's a very vicious. That gur kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's a very raw type of love. Uh-huh. And I still feel like that you and I have that. We, it, we oh, don't yeah. express it all the time. It's, it's, it's maybe only expressed once or twice a week, but we still, it's very clear that we have that. But the philia, like the first time that I remember having this um, was... I had gone on a date with a guy, um, and we had gone, had dinner. I think we'd went back to his place, maybe even my place. I don't know. We'd had sex. Um, and then I left him and, and came to your place. And by the time I got your, to your place, you had just had your date leave. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, you had, of course, had sex with him. You had right. had dinner and sex with him. Um, but I was in your shower, and you were sitting on your toilet. The lid was closed. Um, <laughs> you had your pajama pants on. But you were sitting there. We were discussing this, like this relationship, what we had had with each other person. You know yeah. what you had had with your partner, and what I had had with my partner, and what we both enjoyed about it, and what it was this wonderfully beautiful, intimate moment of the two of us sharing our sexual relationships. Knowing that I was going to spend the night with you, mm-hmm. we were going to have sex. That was why I was in the That's shower. That's why you were in the shower. Was to wash off the yeah. previous person so that because, you and I... Because, side note, whenever we would go out, whenever we have, even still to this day, yeah. when we have dates with other people and come home before we have sex with each other, we always shower. Yes. So Whether you yeah. shower at the person's house or you share yeah. at your own house, you shower before we have sex with them. Yeah. And so I was washing off that previous person and you had already been out in the shower, you know, and it was this wonderful, like beautifully intimate moment um, of us sort of, that was that was sort of when clearly, I guess, according to this definition, that I started to develop this philia for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it, it was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is interesting because, you know, when you think of it in this definition and then you think about all the philias and fetishes, um, it makes a little bit more sense as to why that is the, um, what's the end of the word? Why that philia is the end oh, of the that? the suffix. Suffix, yeah. So why it is that suffix? Um, because it, it talks about, you know, being founded on, on goodness and associated not only with mutual benefit, but also companionship, dependability, and trust. Yeah. And when you look at the, the kink community and, you know, people that, that share that, that is a lot of, of what you see there is yeah. they have that, that trust in their partner and their partner in the kink world may not be their partner in daily life. Right. Um, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, and, you know, another thing that, that sort of bugs me about it is the, um, I think the vast majority of the populace, if you say philia, they have a really negative connota- connotation yeah. to it. You yeah. know, we hear philia, we immediately feel we think of, like I thought of, necrophilia or <laughs> pedophilia or these negative... You think of the negative things the, first. The bad ones, yeah. um, which I guess it depends on 
it's only bad if you do something bad with it. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a, you look at a gun or a knife, it as itself isn't a bad thing. It's people that and how they wield it is right. what makes it bad. And I think that's true of, of many uh, sexual philias. Yeah. Um, if you want more information on that, the the book is Perv, and it's a it's a fantastic book um, where he talks about uh, the the both history of the study of and the understanding of these sort of fringe sexual philias. It's a really it's a great a great read. So the book is Perv, the Sexual Deviant in All of Us by Jesse Baring. Yeah. Um, fantastic, fantastic read. It gives an interesting perspective on a lot of things. Yeah. Um, definitely worth checking out if you haven't read it or listened to it on I on would Audible. highly recommend yeah. it. He's got another book. Um, I don't remember what the name of the book is, but it's fantastic where he talks. But he's basically trying to understand um, all the weird shit that's wrong with our anatomy. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's sort of a history of anatomy. Fantastic. Jesse Baring. Check I don't think I've read that one. I'll have to check yeah, it out. It's, it's great. All right. Are ready for number three? Sure. All right. Number three is, let's see, they even have a pronunciation here. Let's see if I can do it. Storge. Storge. Um, it's S-T-O-R-G-E. Storge. Storge. Um, is that where or Storge? I, is, is that a, is that a cabinet in which I put my OJ? <laughs> Could be store gay. Store gay. Um, okay. Is, is that a <laughs> cabinet, is that a where, you cabinet put the where I put my, <laughs> my gay, or, oh, gay orange, orange juice? Um, <laughs> fuck, store gay. Oh, wow. I would not have gotten I, this one. I, 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 don't even, I don't even have a vague clue. <laughs> I'm glad can you're I, guessing because I, I wouldn't know Can this. I phone a friend on this one? Because um, store, store gay. Store gay. I don't know. Ooh, how, who else would you phone other than a friend? Who else might... Know something about you? Um, another friend? Family. Uh, oh, I don't want to phone them. Yeah, it's familial <laughs> love. Ah, uh, yes, familial love. Yes, it is a kind of or, or so, a love that that loves you, but only if you do exactly what they want you to do. <laughs> so this says uh, storge or familial love is a kind of philia pertaining to the love between parents and their children. It differs from most philia in that it tends, especially with younger children, to be unilateral or asymmetrical. More broadly, uh, stor- storge is the fondness born out of familiarity or dependency, and unlike eros or philia, does not hang on our personal qualities. People in the early stages of a romantic relationship often expect unconditional storge, but find only the need and dependency of eros. And if they're lucky, the maturity and fertility of philia. Given enough time, eros tends to mutate into storge. Fascinating. Wow. Okay, so that means that yeah. you and I may have moved into the storge. All right. All right. So let's dissect this a little. Cause yeah. I'm having yeah. trouble here. Um, am, am I to understand then that storge is, or storge, is the, like, it's that long term comfortable love? Mm-hmm. I would say so, because, but what, what I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around is the, uh, and I get it from, you know, in the parent child relationship being that unilateral or asymmetrical, but it does then go on to say it's the fondness born out of familiarity or dependency. So I get that side of it when, it, when you're talking about a romantic relationship, but I don't like the asymmetrical unilateral part in a, when you're talking about a relationship like ours. But I guess you have to look at, there are all these different kinds of love, and there is that familial love, you know, you have love with friends, love of right. whatever, so I guess, you you know, I can't always think of it as you and I partner kind of love. So maybe that's the distinction so, I need to think of it in a different I'm, way. I'm trying to come up with a way in which, because unilateral to me means one person, it, it's it's going one way, right? Yeah. It, it's, so you feel something about me that I don't necessarily feel about you. Right. Um, but it does say, especially you know, parents, especially with younger children. So younger children, maybe I'm not going to say they don't feel it, but they can't. You no, know, they. But I would say they can't express it, but they do. Children do express love. No, but they don't feel it the same way. Yeah. I don't. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that children don't feel love the way parents. They feel dependency. Okay, they, fair you enough. Grow and right. learn love, but the the what they have so early is on is dependency. Then. So that. 
Yes, but kind of, so then I'm trying yeah. to come up with this a, a way for you and I to sort of feel this as well. Um, and dependence, I don't like, I don't like the word dependency, even though I just used it. Um, but so let's imagine a situation in which a fondness born out of familiarity or dependency and unlike Eros or Philia, it does not hang on our personal qualities. Fondness built out of... Yeah, so I can't come up with that. Because I was even trying to think of, like, bear with me, karaoke. Where mm-hmm. I like to get up and perform karaoke, you don't. Mm-hmm. But I'm assuming you like that I like to get up and perform t- karaoke. So that's a, that is definitely a one-way street. Um, you enjoy... You but- love the fact that I like to perform. But is it more so, because it does say, does not hang on our personal qualities, is it more so that if you do something that irritates me, you know, once you get to this point of a relationship, I can then accept it or ignore it, you know, it's, <laughs> that it, that doesn't really affect my love for you anymore? Maybe. I don't know. That's a hard one for me. This I'm is I'm not difficult. sure that we feel this, because yeah. we have no children. <laughs> but at the same time, it talks about Eros moving into this. Yeah, yeah. It does say given enough time. Maybe we haven't had enough time. <laughs> Give us 20 more years. Yeah. Um, That's a hard one. I don't... I sort of get the concept, but I, I have a hard time... You know, and I'll admit, I sort of see relating this with, it to our life. Possibly with my parents, where, you know, my parents do love each other. And I have no doubt of that it, it's both... I, I think they have a philia. I think they have an eros. Um, but it's clearly one parent is de- more dependent on the other parent. Okay. There's Without a doubt. Right. Um... And maybe that the one parent sort of enjoys... That the other one is dependent. Is dependent, yeah. yeah. So they enjoy being the parent... Right. You know, of, of their own partner. I don't know. Okay. Being dependent upon. Yes. They, yeah. they enjoy being dependent upon. Right. Depended upon, yeah. Okay. I can see that. I don't know. This is a hard one for me to... I don't like it. Yeah, I, I, get it, I get it from parent-child, but at the same time, like, in a partner relationship... Yeah. Or even a friend relationship, it's hard for me to try and get that. But That sounds like you're using the other person. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on. All right, moving on. <laughs> Fuck you, oh, yeah. Greeks. Yeah. We're going to go to number four now. Um, so this one I know from church. Yeah. That sounds great. Agape. Mm. Ah, agape or agape, which means that um, your legs are often spread <laughs> wide. Um my um, anal cavities are often agape, um, ready for thine own service to be placed upon it. So this is the swinger club kind of love. This is the swinger, <laughs> swinger love. Uh, clearly the swinger love. Um, uh, you're clearly mispronouncing agap, agape. Well, that makes the first sentence a lot more interesting. But go ahead. <laughs> Continue and then I'll read it. Um, yes. Yeah, so when I feel agape for you, <laughs> um, I feel agape for many of our partners, most of them male. <laughs> Um, I'm actually a little agape right now. I gotta be honest. Uh, <laughs> All right, it's gonna be a fun night yeah, then. Like, Can't I'm, wait to finish this up. <laughs> Bill, Bill agape. Um, I, I, <laughs> uh, I, agape is not a word. <laughs> <laughs> it is a word. <laughs> <laughs> the Greeks are dead. It Fuck is a word, and it's a type of love. <laughs> I have never looked into anybody's eyes and went, uh, I agape you. <laughs> <laughs> and if I did, I'm pretty sure that's why I would be single. So have yeah. I ever agape you? I've agaped you a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but you liked it. All right, are you ready for this? Sure. All right, here we go. Uh, this is what the article says. Agape is universal love. Such as the love for strangers. <laughs> <coughs> yep. Swing your love. I'm not You're done. I'm not done yet. Please continue. Such as the love for strangers, nature, or God. <laughs> I hear God's hung. Like, like, like a God. <laughs> uh, unlike Storge. That's why Mary Storge, walked with a limp. Whatever. So unlike the previous one, uh, it does not depend on affiliation or familiarity. Also called charity by Christian thinkers, agape can be said to encompass the modern concept of altruism, defined as unselfish confer- concern for the welfare of others. Recent studies link altruism with a number of benefits, 
In the short term, altruism leaves us with a euphoric feeling, the so-called helper's high. In the longer term, it is associated with better mental and physical health, as well as longevity. At a social level, altruism serves as a signal of cooperative intentions and also of resource availability and so of mating or partnering potential. It also opens up a debt account, encouraging beneficiaries to reciprocate with gifts and favors that may be of much greater value to us than those uh, with which we feel able to part. More generally, altruism or agape helps to build and maintain the psychological, social, and indeed environmental fabric that shields, sustains, and enriches us. Given the increasing anger and division in our society and the state of our planet, we could all do with quite a bit more agape. Oh, for fuck's sake, absolutely fucking lootly. Okay, look, this is what I've learned from this. <laughs> if you don't exercise agape, you're an absolute dick. <laughs> like, or cunt. I'm mm-hmm. not sexist. Mm-hmm. Um, like, so agape is clearly you should be nice to people. It's, yeah. It, the, you be should, nice to people around you. Just be nice to people. It's not hard. Yeah, so... Um, in light of the recent hurricane that hit um, hit Texas, mm-hmm. Harvey, right? Yes. Yes. In, ty- in, 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 in light of Harvey, don't pray because that does jack. Give money. It makes you feel good. You can pray, but also oh. give money, give resources, yeah. give time, go help. Do something yeah. that helps people. Don't yeah. don't just don't just do nothing. And I'm gonna I'm gonna count praying as doing nothing. Do something. You can pray, absolutely. But do something that is actually useful. Don't do just that. Um, yeah. That will help people. Yeah. Um, like literally help people, not sort of emotionally, religiously, or 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 hopefully help people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's so agape is. It's it, almost that. It's like don't be a dick. It's that's almost like that it. that pay it forward type thing. Yeah. You know, do something nice for somebody, and it's it'll come back to you at some point. Like just just be nice to people. And it goes beyond <laughs> so that. I, while I appreciate that, it's like. It's not even expecting anything because pay it no. forward means for me. Pay it forward means I expect to get something out of it someday. But what if you're the first one? Then you don't. But someday you expect it to come around. That's what no, it all. Okay, fair enough. Like just do something because you're a nice person. Yeah. Because because people deserve it and like people are suffering and you don't want to see people hurt. Like be nice because because you're a, part of a, a human condition and that you you want to help people. Um, Agape makes me sad because I don't see nearly enough of it in the in the world. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's hard. You have to look for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm the sucker. People, I'm the one that gives money to it, homeless people. I was gonna say we've seen it day to day because I know recently we were on the bus and a girl comes to get on and she was trying to buy a bus ticket and it was like she needed five dollars yes. and she only had two something and so a couple people pulled out some coins yeah. and start giving her coins you and that's know? a and wonderful thing that's what we should do yeah. we we are part of again we are part of this human condition we should all sort of band together and help people and if that makes me naive and and foolish then i would much rather be naive and foolish than than jaded and yeah. and um, absolute fuckwit <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So move your agape. Get yeah. off your agape and help other people. It does say, though, it is interesting because talking about the pay it forward part, but it does say it also opens up a debt account encouraging beneficiaries to reciprocate with gifts and favors. Which is weird. So I get it because, you know, you're doing something for other people. So maybe you do on some level expect it to come back. But I don't think that expectation should be there. Look, so I, I agree with you, but for me, at least, it is something. It, and I, I understand what they're saying. It, it is a debt account. So when I give money or give time or give something to somebody, yeah. I feel that positive reflection for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, when you do something, you know, and even if you don't, tell anyone about it, you still feel that the positive ramifications of the positive thing that you've done, the the ramifications of the positive thing you've done. Um, And, you know, if you talk about it with other people, you relive that experience. And by reliving that experience, oh, you know, I gave... You get that high again. Or I volunteered and did this. You get that high again. You feel that again. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It is a... It's an investment that you make for yourself. And I think that that's... 
But I think it's good to think of it as an investment for yourself, not that you expect something from other people. I, and that's, I think that's yeah. the way it is. It is, it's an investment for me, not yeah. I do it expecting someone else to either recognize me or, or right. do something back for me. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree yeah. with that. It's an investment into our own bank. <laughs> Weird. Alrighty. All right. So, so I think those are the original four Greek ones, at least, um, that we found. I don't know. Some sites say there were four originals. Some say there's six, whatever. This one has seven different types. And so, but I think those were the four that I saw repeatedly as the, the types of Greek love. Okay. But we're going to go for five, six, and seven here. Awesome. So what we call as uh, podcast time fillers. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just reading the article. <laughs> I know. I'm being, a, I'm being a dick. Um, uh, show me some agape. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so number five is Ludus. Oh, okay. my God. I dated Ludus in college, and <laughs> God, he was hot. I mean, was she did these wonderful things with her mouth, and he did this great... Oh, Ludus. Okay, Ludus, Ludus, Ludus. I did not date this person in college. Um, Ludus. Um, yeah, I would Can have- I get a hint? Um, Can I get like a ludicrous? Ooh. Oh, oh, there so you go. So is it do with the? It's do with the? It's it's have to do with the moon. It's cyclic. It's a cyclic moon thing. Um, I think ludicrous was actually closer. What is ludic- ludicrous? It's crazy. So it's about it's about like mind blowing love. It's crazy monkey sex. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, my SAT score just went up. <laughs> All right. This okay. is um, this one is not a long description, so here we go. Okay, excellent. Um, it starts with crazy monkey sex. No, it, it does not. It does not. <laughs> so, I just want to see the article in Psychology Today that has that starts with crazy monkey. It says sex. crazy monkey yeah. sex. Okay, we're gonna have to find. There's got to be one somewhere, right? I hope Maybe? so. Maybe I don't know. Uh, so Ludus is playful or uncommitted love. Okay. So we know crazy monkey sex yeah, will yeah. work. Uh, it can involve activities such as teasing and dancing, or more overt flirting, seducing, and conjugating. The focus is on fun and sometimes also on conquest, with no strings attached. Ludus relationships are casual, undemanding, and uncomplicated, but for all that, can be very long-lasting. Ludus works best when both parties are mature and self-sufficient. Problems arise when one party mistakes Ludus for Eros, whereas Ludus is in fact much more compatible with Philia. Okay, so what I'm getting from this, uh-huh. this excites me a lot. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm rushing a semi right now. Um, so Ludus is clearly what we have with most of our swinger friends. I would agree. Uh, and I yes. love that. That's yes. like the definition you just read just... It makes me so happy and warm and happy. Which is interesting because we there are some of our swinger friends that we're really close to, and we say that we love them. And yes. this, I would say, is the way. It's that playful, uncommitted kind of way. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I love you. I don't want to marry you. Right. I don't, I don't want to see you every goddamn day. I don't day. want to have a life with yeah, you. But, but, but yeah. I do love you, and you have value. And, and without you, my life is less. I like the sentence, the focus is on fun and sometimes also on conquest. Which yes. <laughs> is awesome. What, there was a, in fact, I'm glad you said that. Because no what were the attached. sentence be, uh, before that? Um, it says, it can involve activities such as teasing and dancing or more overt flirting, seducing, and conjugating. Okay, so I loved the teasing, dancing, and then go straight into conjugating. <laughs> like, yeah, let's con- <laughs> so We do this very often with our swinger friends. We conjugate. <laughs> we go... I'm laugh. I laugh. I'm laughing. I laughed. I will have laughed. I mean, it's like we do that. You know, yeah. I love yeah. the the uh, present future tense. Mm-hmm. Ugh, sploosh. <laughs> yes, I fuck. How many verb tenses do you? I have? will have fucked. <laughs> I've fucked. <laughs> yeah, that's we I conjugate. I am fucked. I, the, <laughs> um, if you're a friend of ours, you better learn to conjugate because you know what? If you can't conjugate, you can't <laughs> propagate. That's what I like to say. Um, we don't actually say that. No, um, no, no, don't listen to him. I, I really, Ludus, that makes me happy. Yeah, I love that one. It's it's such a great it's such a great term for a type of love that we all know and we all have. 
Um, but it also, it almost provides a little bit of validity to those, like the booty call kind of relationship. Oh, absolutely. You know, maybe not necessarily one night stands, but to booty calls where you have someone that keeps coming back again and again. But again, you don't want a life with them. Yeah. But you still want to have fun. You still want to enjoy their company. And, and, and you know that they have value. And that's yes. the thing. That, and that's my that's one of my issues with many kind of, of these um, swinger or hookup relationships is that oftentimes we we don't have a word or, or a name that mm-hmm. sort of puts enough gravitas on what the relationship is. Mm-hmm. Um you know, you're like, oh, you're my best, you're my friend, or you're my best friend, or you're even a, a fuck buddy, a play friend, or a play friend. Yeah, and none of those really, none of those have the the weight that I want for them. I agree. Um, so I feel like we should come up with a new word with a name, Ludus, a, a root name, Ludus. Okay. Um, and and maybe we should start saying, oh, you're you're our Ludus. Yeah. Or can you use it as a verb? I Ludus you. No. <laughs> Um, Speaking I, of conjugating, a, a ludite. <laughs> you're 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 a ludite. I don't know. I, and and I just want I want a word that sort of. If anyone out there has suggestions, send them to us, <laughs> please. Because I'm struggling. God damn it. <laughs> yes. But I want a word that is is more than friend, but not quite. Not partner. Lover or yeah. partner. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be nice. It would be lovely to have. Um, mm-hmm. But that definition. I like just, the definition. Yeah, that yeah, definition really kind great. of turns me on. Yeah. All right. We got two more, right? <laughs> yes, we ah, do. I'll do what I can. Look. All right. All right. Number six. All right, number six. Pragma. Pragma. Ooh, wait. No, wait. Pragmatist. Uh, pragmatic. What does that mean? That means, um, <laughs> I love that I can come up with a word, but I have no idea what it means. <laughs> um, if I'm pragmatic, I am logical, I am to the point, and I am um, relatively terse. Focused, I would say. I would say focused, yeah. yeah. So how am I doing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's your goddamn article. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're along the right lines. Okay. So I'm a focused, um, pragmatic, like to the point kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're really good friends that talk a lot. <laughs> would you like to hear the definition? Sure. Why okay. not? Go for it. Pragma is a kind of practical love founded on reason or duty. Oh, that's what I said. Friends that talk a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Found, okay. So it's founded on reason or duty and one's longer term interests. Sexual attraction takes a back seat in favor of personal qualities and compatibilities, shared goals, and making it work. In the days of arranged marriages, pragma must have been very common. Although unfashionable, Ooh, it remains... Although unfashionable, Sorry. it remains widespread, most visibly in certain high-profile celebrity and political pairings. Many relationships that start off as Eros or Ludus end up as various combinations of Storge and Pragma. Pragma may seem opposed to Ludus, but the two can coexist, with one providing a counterpoint to the other. In the best of cases, the partners in the Pragma relationship agree to turn a blind eye, or even a sympathetic eye, as in the case of uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and Jean-Paul Sartre? Sartre? Sartre. Sartre? Yeah. Okay, people are yelling at me. I, I don't know. I don't know who these people are. Um, or Vita Sackville-West and Harold Nicholson. Okay, so this is great because they, they missed chose. Do you know who they all are? Well, I, I know the first couple, but there's a better analogy that everyone knows. Okay. Which is uh, King Arthur, Guinevere, and Sir Lancelot. Oh, oh, so oh yeah. Guinevere and King Arthur, they, they married for for, for power mm-hmm. and, and for this Which was uh, very common. Pragma. Yeah. It, was, it was pragmatic. Yeah. Um, but Guinevere actually loved Lancelot. Mm-hmm. She had arrows for Lancelot, pragma for... Mm-hmm. Uh, for uh, uh, King Arthur, um, and and that was where we came up with the phrase courtly love because not Courtney love that's a, <laughs> that's a <laughs> lot more drug infused kind of love um, but courtly love which is this romantic uh, passionate love because um, for the longest time people married to to blend. Property, yeah, um, which is For power, resources, things like that. Which, which is, is pragma, pragma, which is yeah. pragmatic. Which yeah. I absolutely love that now. Um, but courtly love was this passionate, like I love you because you're beautiful. You turn me on, not because you have power and wealth. Right. And so the perfect triangle there for pragma, eros, um, and and luda mm-hmm. is King Arthur, Guinevere, and Sir Lancelot. I like that. Yes, that makes sense yeah. to me. 
um, Sart, but that I, I'm I'm vaguely familiar with that relationship, but it, it very yeah. much was a they they married for power, and he was a whoremonger. I'll have to look these two couples up and see the details of them now. I'm kind of curious, um, but that's for after this. Um, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I, I don't think we have time to do that right now. No, that's yeah. that's I, I like that. Yeah. I, but that is that makes complete and total sense. So yeah. yeah. I get it, because it, it still happens today. I know it was more oh, common yeah. before, but it absolutely well, happens today. Yeah. And I would say not just with, you know, it talks about high-profile celebrity and political pairings, but, I mean, it happens day to day. Absolutely. Out, out in like, I'm, the normal I, world, you know, it happens I feel like, a lot. I mean, not always, but you and I have, a, mm-hmm. on occasion, a, a pragma yeah, sort of relationship. Absolutely. We we both get what we need out of one another. And and sometimes that is sex. But you know, I'm a firm believer and I know it, it frustrates you sometimes, but I'm a firm believer that relationships are sign curves. They go up and they go down. Yeah. They go up and go down. Absolutely. And both of us have our own sign curves. And if we're if we're out of sync it's, it's really frustrating. It's frustrating, and it sucks. But at the same time, we're not going to leave each other because right. we're temporarily out of sync. Because we have this sort of pragma relationship as well, mm-hmm. that means that we're better and stronger together than we are apart. So we right. we either work on the the problem of synchroni- of ill synchronization, mm-hmm. or or we find other people around us who we can sync with at that time. Right. Um, and, and ultimately we always come back into sync together and that's, mm-hmm. that's important because we both work on it and we go outside and find other people yeah. to, to yeah. help us while we're not in sync. Um, and it, it makes sense, you know, so it's, it's not, I, I don't see this kind of a love as a bad thing. At oh all. no, not at all. Um, no, I think it's a very necessary, it's necessary. part of life. Yeah. And I think if you look at a lot of people out there that I think a lot of people can sort of relate to this. It's like we're still together because of pragmatic rela- yeah. reasons. Um, and and it, it could be it's, it, it but, could be anything, you know, f- I mean, if you look at it, I'm going to say from a very practical standpoint, um, it can be, you know, reasons that we've seen in people are children Housing, um, especially depending on where you live, if you can't afford yeah. for one partner yeah. to move out or another, um, or even time. We've be, been together so long that it just yeah. makes sense for us to stick together. It's just easier to stay yeah. together. It's and, easier to stay together than it is to try to find another partner. Right. Um, but there's there's all kinds of different things, and and I, you know, have friends who, in the past, have had friends who were in arranged marriages. Um, you know, it was just, it was, it's part of their culture and they're in arranged marriage and they're just, they're fine with it. They're okay. Yeah. They're like, yeah, you know, I, I do like my partner, you know, and again, are you in love? Well, clearly this is a type of love. And yeah. so, you know, yes, but is it arrows all the time? No, Yeah. there's moments, but you know, that's, yeah. I would say that's any relationship. I agree. I, I totally agree. Um, and I recently read an, uh, and I'd love to know if this is correct or not, but I recently read an article saying that, um, um, Pre-arranged marriages have a statistically less likelihood for divorce than. Interesting. And admittedly, I don't know. It, it, are they including social stigmatism on it? Right. Because I'm assuming that um, cultures in which pre-arranged marriages are more likely, mm-hmm. divorces are probably greaterly or more greaterly frowned upon. Yeah. So I don't know, but I just think that's kind of interesting if yeah. that's. If if you if you take everything into account, you know it may equal. also be as well setting your expectations going into a relationship that things aren't always going to be roses. Yeah, Whereas, that's true. Yeah, exactly. You know, look at look at your think back to you know your first long term relationship. You probably expected things to be roses most of the yeah, time. Yeah, we always expected and, things to be great. Yeah, and it's that's not always the case. So maybe I wonder how much of that has to do with just the simple expectations going into it. You know. You got your meat? You happy I'm getting, now? I'm getting stared at because <laughs> I, I stood up and got some... Uh, he has to get his meat in his mouth. Got my Serrano. Get my Serrano on. Yeah. You turn me on yeah. with your... Shut up. The pragmatism? Pragmatic talk. <laughs> uh, all right. So are you ready for number seven? All right. Last up. Number seven. All right. I'm not sure how to say this one either. Apparently, I need to learn how to say these Take things Greek. first. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, f- I'm going to go with... Philatia. Ah, it's Philatia. P H I L A U T I A. My God, you did Philatia on me yesterday morning. <laughs> um, 
I didn't <laughs> think you were going to let me come in your mouth, and then I did. And I was like, holy shit. It was like literally mind-blowing sex. Uh-huh. I'm hoping Falacia is where, is some sort of... Oral love? That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Even if it's just like we talk about love, like (laughs) sometimes we do, that's what Uh I'm hoping it's still oral love because I want to take it to Falashi O. Because PH, I mean, technically Falashio is starting with F. Fuck. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so Falashia, I'm going to say it that way, whether it's right or not, sure, right. Um, is self-love, which can be healthy or unhealthy. Unhealthy self-love is akin to hubris. In ancient Greece, a person could be accused of hubris if he placed himself above the gods or, like certain modern politicians, above <laughs> the greater good. Hello, uh, Trump. <laughs> many believed that hubris led... That doesn't say that. Uh, many <laughs> believed that hubris led to destruction or nemesis. Today, hubris has come to mean an inflated sense of one's status, abilities, or accomplishments, especially when accompanied by haughtiness or arrogance. As it disregards truth, hubris promotes injustice, conflict, and enmity. Healthy self-love is akin to self-esteem, which is our cognitive and, above all, emotional appraisal of our own worth relative to that of others. More than that, it is the matrix through which we think, feel, and act, and reflects and determines our relation to ourselves, to others, and to the world. Self-esteem and self-confidence do not always go hand in hand. In particular, it is possible to be highly self-confident and yet to have profoundly low self-esteem, as is the case with many performers and celebrities. Uh, People with high self-esteem do not need to prop themselves up with externals such as income, status, or notoriety, or lean on crutches such as alcohol, drugs, or sex. They are able to invest themselves completely in projects and people because they do not fear failure or rejection. Of course, they suffer hurt and disappointment, but their setbacks neither damage nor diminish them. Owing to their resilience, they are open to growth experiences and relationships, tolerant of risk, quick to joy and delight, and accepting and forgiving of themselves and others. So so that was quite long-winded. That's long-winded, but um, number one, I feel like uh, fellatia is completely misnamed. Um, but number two, you said a sentence in there that some about self, you can have high self-confidence and still low self-esteem. Um, yes. So it is pos- so it says in particular it is possible to be highly self confident and yet to have profoundly low self esteem as right. is the case with many performers and celebrities. I wish that I, I wish that like I had heard that twenty years ago mm-hmm. um, because I always assumed that self confidence and self esteem were hand in hand hand in hand they were mm-hmm. interlinked um, and I know that my parents think that right I, I think I know without a doubt and I know my grandparents thought that. That because I was self-confident, I thought highly of myself. But, and even now, you know, it's, it's one of those things that um, I, I, have, I have great self-confidence. I don't think there's anybody who would argue that. Right. Um, I am more than happy to get on stage and perform. Um, and, and I'm very confident that what I do, I do very well. Mm-hmm. But self-esteem was... While I feel confident that what I do, I do well, I don't feel like necessarily what I do matters. And I think that's... You don't feel worthy of it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the difference between self-confidence and um, self-esteem is that, you know, when you're, when you're self-confident, you're confident to put yourself out there and, and, and express that emotion mm-hmm. or... Um, or do something in front of people that n- even not all people would would feel comfortable doing, um, but self esteem means that you don't feel that you have enough value. You you do these things that are positive, but they don't. But you don't actually feel valuable for it. Okay. Um, and that's you know I, I absolutely love that distinction. And I, I wish I had heard that a long time ago. Because even now, you know, it's like with the performances that I that I have done and will do, um, I'm confident. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in doing it. But at the same time, often you walk on stage and, you, and it's, a, it's a big stage with a bunch of people. And they expect that you feel big. But ultimately, 
you still feel small. No matter how big the stage, no matter how big the audience, um, the performance that you give, no matter how great it is, you still feel small and insignificant and unimportant. And that's a very yeah. difficult delineation, I think, for a lot of people to understand. Yeah, they do. A lot of people do see them going hand in hand, and it's hard to separate them. You know, and I often think of uh, Robin Williams, perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Big personality, big, happy on the surface guy, but he was miserable and he was sad. And it kind of sort of goes on with that um, sad clown mm-hmm. sort of. Sad thing. clown syndrome? Sad, yeah, thank you. Sad clown syndrome. Um, that, you know, he puts off this air of, of delight and happiness when in fact he's miserable on the inside. And I get that. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I, I love to perform and I love to make people laugh and make them happy. But at the same time, the, the same moment in which I might be making you happy. I might be miserable on the inside. Right. Right. I'm, I'm doing this for you, not for me. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of people miss that. Right. Yeah. Well, so how do you feel about... Um, um, about the... Hubris is the only word I'm coming up with, but I can't remember the Latin word. Falacia? F- I don't like Falacia. That's not a good... Yeah. Um, I call self-love <laughs> masturbation, but it's different. <laughs> that could be healthy or unhealthy, apparently, it says. I don't I mean, see how it's unhealthy. No, it's unhealthy. I guess if, uh, yeah, like, yeah. if I don't touch you because I'm touching myself, then that's a problem. Okay. But I don't think Unless that's we're a, having masturbation races. Fair enough. <laughs> but I don't think it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's funny because it does really focus on hubris here. Um but it's because of looking at the unhealthy self-love and then, you know, the healthy self-love is akin to self-esteem, which I get that. What do you, how do you feel your self-esteem is? Oh, I think my self-esteem is good. You, you think you're strong on self-esteem? I think so. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. No, no. I, <laughs> you've always seemed, uh, you know, confident to me. Yeah. But do you feel like your self-esteem and self-worth are linked Um, or are they two separate things? I would say I would say they're linked. Yeah. yeah. So, do you think that your self esteem and self worth self worth are equally high? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I also don't have the same issues you do in accepting myself either. Oh, do you think that's it? Um, because I think I think so. Because well, it I think it has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, because I'm just a lot more practical than you, and <laughs> you are. I, and I, I think that has a lot to do with it, at least for me and for our relationship and how you and I both are. Um, but I think my self esteem is good. I would say my self confidence is good. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if we had to put a scale to it. That would be hard. But <laughs> you don't have to put a scale to yeah. it. Yeah. No, I, 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 but it is interesting because it does, hmm, yeah. Because what? Well, it this this sentence here, and I mean, again, this is you know one person's way of sentence, but it says people with high self esteem do not need to prop themselves up with external such as income, status, notoriety, or lean on crutches such as alcohol, drugs, or sex. We clearly like our alcohol. We clearly like our yeah, sex. Yeah, yeah. But, but I don't feel like it's a crutch. It's not a crutch. We're not leaning yeah. on that. It's yeah. like, um, and I get that. It, it doesn't it's define us. It's something we us. enjoy, but it's not a yeah. crutch. It doesn't define yeah. us. Like, um, I mean, arguably, sex, sexuality and our, our sex does define, does define me. But... I do like here that it says, of course, they suffer, talking about people with high self-esteem, uh, because it says they're able to invest themselves completely in projects and people um, because they do not fear failure or rejection. Of course, they suffer hurt and disappointment, but their setbacks neither damage nor diminish them. And, uh, and that, so it's that resilience. And, and I, that's I how like we approach that. swinging. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you can, if you're not interested in us, that's fine. That's fine. It that yeah. doesn't stop us from, yeah. you know, which is why I don't think that sex is a crutch. It's a hobby. You yeah. know, it's like, it's not, we, we have our own sex together. That is great. Right. Um, and anything else is, uh, cumulatively, cumulatively additive. Yeah. Not like we have to have it. Right. And if you get it, great. And if we don't, if there's a couple that we're really interested yeah. in or that maybe we've, we've played with and then, you know, things 
have happened. Fizzled out. Right, yeah, fizzled that's out. That's fine. Then sure, you might be disappointed, but at the same time, it's not going to, you know, we that's fine. We can come back from and that. And I think that ultimately you handle that better than I handle it. Yeah. Because you look at it from a very pragmatic, <laughs> look at us using words, um, pragmatic point of view where you're like, okay, it wasn't meant to be forever. Right. Whereas I look at it from a, oh, I'm, I'm really sad because that that person really they filled a spot that I wanted filled. Yes. Um, yes. But yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I think that's a topic for another podcast. That's tough. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I rant and ramble. All right. Yeah. So, um, so that was, if you're interested in, in reading it for yourself or yes. looking any of this back up again, it was on psychology com, And the article is, these are the seven types of love by Neil Burton. Um, so, so if you look up seven types of Greek love on uh, Google, uh, it's I, it's going to be one of the top yeah, first it'll page be results. Um, but I, th- I thought it was really interesting because we always talk about love and everyone has an idea as to what love is. But there are many different kinds of love because the love I feel for you is not the love for my parents, for my brother, my friends, our swinger partners. So it is interesting to be able to to put a little more context around all those different types of love and define them a little bit better with these words. Yeah. I mean, and, and this modern view of romantic love is not an old view. It's not an old view. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a very recent, like um, in, in the last 150, 170 years. Um, I, I, in fact, I think the, the first sort of... Um, the first sort of view of romantic love was actually in uh, Madame Bovary's, um, no- the novel Madame Bovary, um, which is 1850-something. I don't know. Look it up. Um, but that's where this idea of romantic love came from. And, right. and I think it's interesting to look at what what is love, mm-hmm. baby? Don't hurt me. <laughs> don't hurt me. Oh, we're no going more. back to that. What is love? Oh, baby, don't let me. Yeah, so, um, mm-hmm. like, I can't help it. Mm-hmm. Don't. Don't encourage him, people. Don't encourage him. Don't judge me. Are you um, sure you don't want the Yoda beatboxing back? <laughs> people have told me they do not want to hear Yoda beatboxing. <laughs> so, ipso facto, I am bringing, like, random 80s songs. Pick your poison, people. Pick your poison. <laughs> so, um, yes, and you can pick your poison. Wherever podcasts are sold. Um, so if you want to hear more Yoda beatboxing, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but message us. Let us know what, listen to this. Let, let us know what you think about it. what mm-hmm. What is love? And I, I don't mean in a singing. What is love to you? I would yeah. love to know. I would like uh, to know. Ha, ha. I didn't mean that. Okay. God damn it. <laughs> Um, but email us, theatomsoflove at gmail.com. Please, please. Uh, we're trying to build our Facebook community, uh, www.facebook.com slash by the by podcast, or you can Twitter verse us at, um, uh, at by the by podcast. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear more from y'all and yeah, reach out uh, to us. what, what your opinion of love or any of the, uh, the, the Greeks versions of love. Let us know. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks.